Well, uh, we're going to be again, of course, as you know, we're studying through the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and the, I entitled this message, The Roots of the Problem. Now, I'm sure you know that most problems start before we actually see the problem start. Meaning, if our engine overheats in our car, the problem probably started some time ago. And we're just now seeing the results of the real problem. Yes, the radiator is getting clogged up. The water's not passing through like it should. Or maybe it's got a small leak. Whatever the case, one thing for sure, the overheating is just the fruits of the real problem. Yet if we don't react to the symptom of overheating by immediately pulling over, it could cause serious damage to the engine, like warping the heads, blowing the head gaskets, or even cracking the engine block. Just like if we never check our oil in between oil changes, a same thing could happen. We could run out of oil because the oil is the lifeblood of the engine. You know that most major engine malfunctions are not caused by the engine, quote, wearing out. They're caused by poor maintenance and not heeding the warning signs like overheating or low oil. Well, in the same way, when we, you and me, have problems that we need to attend to, we need to get to the root of those problems. And as you know, we all have roots, you could say. We've all developed, I could say, maybe bad habits in some areas that we know that are wrong, and they can still be traced back to a bad root. You know, it's like the construction supervisor who tore down the wrong house. What was the root of his problem? He had the wrong address, okay? (laughs) Or the guy in Madrid, Spain, who was running from the police. He tried to hide in a funeral home, so he jumped into an open casket. Yeah, it it didn't work. (laughs) Exactly. I'm with you. It's like, anyway, but why? What was the problem? You know, he wasn't dead. (laughs) The police were looking at him. No, this guy's still breathing, okay? But, uh, But it reminds me when I was little, I used to, you know, I used to have to pull weeds in my backyard. I hated pulling weeds. In fact, I think I'm still bitter over that whole thing, you know. Son, go pull the weeds. It's like, no, I, I hate weeds. But my dad used to tell me, you got to make sure you pull the whole root out, you know. If not, it's going to grow right back. And, and how true is that, you know, uh, about weeds? You know, it, it's like, you know, you don't need the water weeds. You don't need to do anything. They just grow. You know, flowers are a really cool plant. Maintenance. Oh, little baby plants. You know, let me hold your leaf while you grow, you know. Let me water you, fertilize you, care for you, all of these things. Weeds, man, it's nothing. It doesn't rain for nine months in California. You got jack and a beanstalk growing in your backyard, you know. You need a machete to take these things down. But anyway, but then it's the same way with you and me. When we allow our own sin nature. It's like when it just runs wild, it's like, I mean, it doesn't take much to grow. It's like you give our sin nature an inch and it will take a mile. Well, this morning, excuse me, as we continue in our study in the Sermon on the Mount, we will consider three different points. Number one, the roots of the problem. Number two, the law for the problem. And number three, the answer for the problem. So let's read here together, you know, looking at our first point, the root of the problem, we'll pick up in Matthew chapter 5, we'll pick up in verse 21, and he says, Jesus speaking, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you're good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go first and be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law 
while you are with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge and the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid the last cent. You have heard that it has been said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of your parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Well, that's about enough for today. God bless you. Have a nice day. <laughs> it's like, it's like where, where do you go from here with that? Man, this is like, is that like slightly overwhelming or what? I mean, oh my goodness, it's a mouthful to say the least. Well, First, Jesus talked about going to court for murder. We're going to pull this thing apart one step at a time. So let's just take this thing, let's pull it apart, and let's see what he's really talking about. So the first thing he hits is murder and anger. Then he drops the bombshell when he says, yet if you call your brother a fool, you're guilty enough to go to hell. Then he talks about when we come to him with an offering, if we have an attitude with someone or someone has an attitude with us, we're to put down the offering, we're to go work out the problems that we have with that person, and then come back and give our offering. Then Jesus brings up sex outside of marriage, and he says, even if we just look at another woman and we lust after her, it's the same thing as actually doing it. Then, as if our heads are not spinning already enough, as we try to comprehend all of this already, you know, Jesus says, and if our eye or our hand makes us stumble, just pluck it out or cut it off, for it's better to go into heaven maimed than to go into hell in one piece. Now, again, what in the world does all of this mean? Well, let's take it apart again, piece by piece. Because the Sermon on the Mount, as you know, was given to us by Jesus to instruct us on how we're to live. Let's not forget what happened to God's word at this time that he's writing this. For it had been compromised by the religious leaders back when Israel was captive to Babylon in Jeremiah's day. You remember what happened there? All through the book of Jeremiah, some 50 some odd chapters, Jeremiah through God, is warning the people. He's saying, we got to repent of our sin because the people were doing what they thought was right in their own eyes. They weren't listening to God's commandments, his statutes. They weren't obeying anything that he said. So God's warning them and warning them for decades. I'm warning you, if you don't stop sinning, I'm going to drop the hammer on you guys. And it's just like, man, there's just people, no one's listening. They actually took Jeremiah, the religious leaders took him, beat him, cursed him, because he was calling them on the carpet for their own sin. And so it was a horrible time. And finally, because they would simply not repent, and they continued in a lifestyle of sin, God said, okay, I'm raising up the Babylonians. And they came in, and they crushed Israel. They took over Jerusalem, and they hauled everybody away with chains back to Babylon. And so there they were there for 70 years. 70 years they were there. They lost a complete generation of people. The common people had forgotten their own Hebrew language. They could no longer read God's word in the original Hebrew. So instead of the religious leaders translating the scripture into Aramaic, a language that the people had learned while they were in Babylon, The scribes and the rabbis monopolized the scriptures to suit themselves. That's why Jesus starts off so many times in this chapter. And in verse 21, he said, you have heard it said. You've heard it said. Why? Because the people didn't read it for themselves. They only heard it. Do we not see this today in mainline denominations? The priest will preach, and he'll preach, but they don't encourage the people to read God's word. We are encouraged throughout the scripture 
to read God's word. We are encouraged, like, be diligent to present yourself as approved of God. Handling accurately the right, the word of truth. We're to rightly divide it and handle it accurately. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So the man of God, the woman of God would be adequately equipped for every good deed. God's telling us, get into the word, know the word, but yet here, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, no, 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 we'll teach you the word. And that's where tradition came in. And today, in a lot of Orthodox churches, they teach you, but you don't see for itself what it's saying. And that's why Jesus said, it's been, you've heard this being said, but Jesus brought clarity by saying, but I say to you, and let's remember who Jesus is. Jesus is the God-man. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the literal word, the logos, the divine expression. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the first and the last. His authority is paramount. He is the final say in every aspect of life. So if there's anyone who's qualified for setting the record straight, it's Jesus. He's not contradicting the word of God. He's endorsing the word of God in its true meaning. Remember, in the Sermon on the Mount, it's all about the heart first. God is looking at how we interact with him from our heart because the heart of the matter is always the matter of the heart. Again, the Jews had allowed the religion to become stale. It was artificial. It was dead. And we see that today in many mainline denominations where things are just dead. It's just religion. It's going through rituals. And that's not what God wants. See, the righteousness revolved with these religious leaders around their external deeds. Let me show you how good I look on the outside. They, they could showcase them outwardly to get the you know, praise of men. Yet their inner purity was completely overlooked, which left many empty and devoid of the spirit on the inside. And as you know, God is way more concerned for the inward purity than for our outward hypocrisy. That's why Jesus would tell the religious leaders, he says, you know what you guys are? You're like going through a stinking mortuary. You're like a, a, you know, a whitewashed tomb on the outside. Oh, you look good. Oh, we're in a mortuary. Oh, look at this white tomb. It's so nice. He says, you look nice on the outside. The problem is you're full of dead men's bones. You're dead on the inside. There's no life on you. So Jesus brings us back. He literally restores us to the original intent of God's commandments with example after example of what we just read. You know, and why did he do this again? Well, he said back in verse 20, look what he said. We looked at that last week. <clears throat> Jesus says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, I know what these guys are all about. I know what these religious leaders are about. And if you don't surpass what they're doing, you're not going to heaven. Not going to happen. Now, on the surface of that statement, you know, it could have all of us saying, well, that counts me out. I mean, really. I mean, it's like, how could I live a life holier than the scribes and the Pharisees? They were the heads of the church. They have the nice flowing robes. They look so pure. They look so honest. They live by what appeared to be the letter of the law. Yet, by focusing on their external obedience, they completely forsook the internal obedience, which is what God really desires. Obeying the law from a, a heart of pure motives. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, focuses on the internal conformity to the spirit of the law instead of the outward conformity to the letter of the law. And what is our root problem again? The root problem is our hearts. 
for the world wants a pat on the back. The, the heart says, yes, look at me, notice me, I'm wonderful, pat me on the back. How can I show myself to you where you'll approve of me? See, we award ourselves on just how great we think we are. And does not, is that not what the world does? I mean, look at all the award shows we have. We have the Oscars, the Emmys, the, the Golden Globes, the, the People's Choice Awards, the, the Critics' Choice, you know, MTV Awards, Country Music Awards, ESPY Awards, Billboard Music. I mean, it's like, come on, enough shows, enough trophies for yourself already. They're just endless. You know, yes, we like to pat ourselves on the back, but what does God say about the condition of the human heart? And this is what separates humanity from God. Humanity says, we are good. And we might have a couple little flaws here and there, but we are good. And we can figure things out. God says this about the heart of man. He says in Jeremiah 17, 9, he says, your heart is despitefully wicked and desperately sick. Okay. <laughs> so... Do I get a trophy? <laughs> it's like, but God goes on to say, but I know the heart and I test the mind. He goes, I know where you're coming from. I know that in your heart, it's just spitefully wicked. Oh man, see, man doesn't want to choke up to that. Man doesn't want to say that I'm a sinner. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that there's none righteous, no, not one. And that's what the Bible says because God calls it like it is. Because he sees us like a clear transparency. There is nothing that we do that God does not see. No matter what good works we do, he even looks at the motive of the heart of why you're doing it. You open a door for someone. Why'd you do it? <laughs> well, they're looking good. Maybe I can get a date with them, you know? I mean, it's like, he knows why you opened the door. You know, it's like, you know, they've done all those little shows on TV, you know, where they have the lady, she's like a beautiful woman, and she runs out of gas on the side of the road, you know, and she's just, you know, the, the, the supermodel, you know, and everyone's pulling over. Yeah, hell, how can I help you? Yeah, let me get you some gas, you know, <laughs> come on. And then they took the same lady, they put a big fat suit on her where she weighed like 500 pounds, and everyone's just like, whoa, lock the doors, boom, hit the pedal to the metal, you know? <laughs> We're not stopping. You see, what is the motive of the heart? Were you really just helping the damsel in distress? Or was there another motive there? See, God looks at the heart. See, first Jesus gives us the example of committing murder here. And he says, if you do this, you'll be guilty before the court. Now, there was two different courts mentioned here in verse 21 and 22. One was the local magistrate's court, and, and this would deal with all issues. Uh, they had the power to judge, even to put people to death. And then there was the Sanhedrin. This was in Jerusalem. This was the final court of appeals. It was like their version of our Supreme Court. And their sentence was up to death also by stoning, if need be. Now, these courts can be traced all the way back to Moses. See, this is where we get our whole system of our judicial system. It goes back to Moses, where he was the judge. And the people had many issues in his day. Think about it for a second. We had three million people or so come out of Egypt from slavery. They've been in slavery their whole life. They don't have any, you, you have no rights. You're nothing. You're a slave. That's it. Well, all of a sudden, God sets them free. Now we got three million people. I can do what I want. Woohoo! Okay, so now they're all doing what they want. Well, guess what? There's a lot of problems. People are having issues with each other. Hey, your tent's on my property. Hey, we're in the desert. We're walking around. It's like, yeah, well, you know, this guy sold me a cow and it turned out lame and it died. It's like, you know, so the people had all kinds of issues with one another. So they would come and bring their issues. So every day they would line up. I mean, the line would be like forever long. And the Bible says that Moses would sit there from morning until late at night hearing all the people's complaints and judging between them. Well, all of a sudden his father-in-law came to visit him one day. So he's visiting, and he's watching his whole line, and he's like thinking, what's going on here? His father-in-law's name was Jethro. He, he originally played on the Beverly Hillbillies. But, uh, no, just kidding. Okay, anyway, but, uh, no, that's, that's not true. <laughs> but anyway, but so Jethro says, so Moses, what are you doing? He says, I'm judging the people. He says, you're going to burn yourself out. 
He goes, why don't you raise up a lot of other judges, have smaller courts, set up different people, take these people, disciple them basically, make sure they understand the law of God and let them judge. And then when you have the really big cases, you could be like, quote, the Supreme Court kind of thing, you know, and let them come to you. But you're going to burn yourself out by doing all this. So that's how we had all these little courts and everything set up because he trained up a lot of other judges so they could judge between the people. And again, yet no matter how many earthly judges we have, we're not capable of judging, though, the issues of the heart or the motives of what people are really thinking. Now, this is where people will say, hey, bro, don't judge me, man. Uh, excuse me. We can totally judge. In fact, we're going to get into this later on in the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to break all this down. But you've ever heard people say, don't judge me, man. You know, don't point your finger at me, man. You know, it's like, listen, we can totally judge people. What we judge is the action. If someone comes and steals your lawnmower and you watch him do it, you can judge him. You're a thief. Oh, don't judge me, man. No, you're a thief. You got my lawnmower, okay? Okay, so we can judge the action. What we can't judge is the heart. So if someone said something to someone, oh, I didn't mean it like that. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, sometimes you say things and they come out wrong. Oh, I'm so, I didn't mean it like that. We can't judge. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, you meant it viciously. I know you. You were stabbing me in the back. He was like, oh, well, hold on now. It's like, I didn't mean it like that. See, we can't judge someone's heart, and that is true. But we can judge the action. And if someone's like saying they're a Christian, yet they're out partying, they're out drinking, they're out sleeping with all kinds of people, you know, we can say, hey, bro, listen, I thought you were a, I thought you were a Christian. Hey, don't judge me, man. It's like, no, hold on. I can judge you. You're out partying all the time. You're coming home drunk, you know, and you're sleeping with all kinds of people. It's like, listen, the Bible says if you say that you know him and yet you walk in darkness, you are a liar and the truth isn't in you. The Bible gives us all kinds of places in Scripture to judge people of what they're doing. But when we judge them, we can't go to them with a pointing finger. We have to go to them and just say, look, how can I help you? And you know what you're doing is wrong. If you continue to do this, you know, it's a question whether you're even a believer or not. So we have that right to judge. But moving on here, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wants us to judge ourselves. This is all about us judging ourselves. Don't worry about me judging you. How about you judging you? Don't worry about judging me. I need to judge me. He hits us at the very core of our being. He doesn't just say, thou shall not murder. He strikes a chord so much deeper in all of us, all the way to the very core of our heart. So instead of just endorsing the law, which he does, because he says, thou shall not murder, Jesus says to love those around us. His point is simple. If a man hates his brother, that is the very root of the problem. So Jesus says, look, if you're angry with your brother and you lash out at him and you verbally call him a fool, then it's the same as killing him because that is the core issue of where the root to kill comes from. People can just wake up, yeah, I'm going to go kill my neighbor. Why? Well, yeah, I'm just going to kill him. Yeah, no, no. What happens is the neighbor starts irking him. And then it starts, you know, the problem starts. And the tree grows over his fence and the leaves fall in his yard. Then it's like he won't do anything about it. And it's just, it's an ongoing over years. It's like, I hate this guy. He, he parks his car in front of my house instead of his house. It's, a, it's just one thing after another. And that's the root and when the guy finally walks over and, you know, and kills his neighbor, where did it start? It started with the weeds going under his fence that he wouldn't do nothing. About. It started with something stupid. But Jesus knows that's where the root to kill comes from. It's what breeds hate and anger inside of us. Again, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. So here's the message to the believer. Jesus said, if you're coming to me to give me an offering of praise and of love and bringing your tithes and offerings, all of these things, but you know that you have this hate and anger or bad feelings towards another brother or sister, you know, that word raka in the, you know, uh, King James Bible in verse 22, in the original language conveys the thought of scorn. So you're scorning someone, you, you disdain them, you know, you really are considering that person a complete and total idiot. 
God says, slow down, buckaroo. He didn't use buckaroo. I just threw that in. But anyway, he says, slow down before you lift up your arms in praise. We need to stop and go and get right with them first. Jesus wants us to work out all of our grievances before we come to the altar. If not, then we allow that anger in us to kindle like a burning fire, which hinders our fellowship with God and those around us. And left unchecked, we could end up a really bitter person, lacking joy in our life. Yes, the root of the problem is us. Are we willing to obey this or not? Now, I wonder, with all of this in here, I can pretty much guarantee we all have someone that just, oh, oh, you just see the person. You could be having a wonderful day, and then you're at Albertsons, or you're at Ralph's, and you're just shopping. <laughs> there they are, you know, and you're just like, oh, it just ruins your day. Ruins your day. That's it. I'm done. My day's done. Because you, you, you have this thing, this bitter seed that's just grown inside of you. God says you need to forgive them. Well, they don't deserve forgiveness. Well, obviously don't they don't deserve forgiveness. They're an idiot. You already decided that. But the thing is, is Jesus is saying, but what were you when you came to me? Did I not forgive you for everything? Did I not take you? Did I say to you, oh, I've known every thought you've ever thought in your mind. Did he say to you, hey, your mind is like a clear transparency to me. I've seen everything. In fact, 90% of what you have forgotten about, I still remember because I don't forget anything. Did he say, don't waste my time because you're an idiot? No, he didn't say that. We come to Jesus and he says, come to me. Let me just love you. Let me put my arms around you. Let me forgive you for everything you've done. Let me wipe the dirt off you that you've been stained with the world. Let me cleanse you. Let me give you the promise of heaven forever. Let me call you my son and my daughter. Yeah, but God, I don't deserve this. I've been such a wretch. Oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. No, but God, I've done these things. It's like I just I don't I, I can't I can't even deal with my own self. You forget about it. There's no condemnation for you that's in me. See, that's how God deals with us. And all he's asking us to do is to deal the same with others. You do the same thing that I did to you. I have forgiven you. I want you to forgive them. No, it's not easy. But he's only asking you to do what he's already done for us. We cannot leave our heart unchecked. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and slander be put away from you along with all malice and all of these other things. He says, but be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just like Christ in God has forgiven us. Same thing. Which brings up our second point, the law for the problem. Now, we've already seen this in our first point, but... That's why God has given us his law, so that we can clearly know what is right and what is wrong. So he's given us a law so that we know. So there's no question here, what's right, what's wrong. No, we know this clearly because he's wrote it in his law. Yet once again, Jesus gets to the heart, the very pulse of the law making it way more intimate and personal. And by keeping his law the way it was intended to be kept, we are assured of a much deeper and intimate and personal relationship with him. Again, Jesus clarifies what the law says in verse 27. The law says that we should not commit adultery. Now, isn't that pretty much straight up? Hey, don't go sleep with your neighbor's wife. <laughs> it's like, Hey, ladies, can't have the man next door. Sorry, he's already taken, okay? It's pretty straight up here. Don't commit adultery here, you know? But wait, Jesus gives us the true heart and the pulse of the law in verse 28. Jesus says, but if you even look on a woman with lust, or a woman looking on a man with lust, he says it's the same as committing the act. Uh-oh, we're all in trouble here. Okay, we got a big problem here. Jesus is saying, cleanse your hearts and your minds, for that's where the sin is born and bred. No one just wakes up one morning. Yeah. Oh. Hey, honey, how you doing? Oh, great. What are you going to do today? Oh, I'm going to go and commit adultery with the secretary. Oh, great. What? You know, it's like you don't just wake up and go do that. 
It's like, it's like it starts, it works on you. You fantasize about it. Hey, look, boss, the plane, the plane, fantasy island. Yeah, it's like all of a sudden, you know, in your spare time, you know, oh, that new uh, girl working at the shop, you know, she's looking pretty good. You know, it's like, oh, you know, you ladies are like, yeah, you see the hubba hubba neighbor next door. You know, he's mowing his lawn without his shirt on. Oh, yeah, well, let me have my cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> okay, you know, it's like, you know, it's like all of a sudden, you know, you're thinking about it. It's in your head. Jesus is saying, you got to not think about it. you got to get it out of your head. Some say, pastor, pastor, come on. It's the 21st, 21st century here. You can look. You just don't touch. Look, but don't touch. Oh, yeah? This is what the Bible says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, meaning to be set apart. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality, any kind of sexual impurity, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel. Like, keep yourself in control here, okay, for sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion like the unbelievers who do not know God. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but to be set apart. Consequently, he who rejects this, rejects what? What are we talking about here? Sexual immorality is not rejecting man. You're not rejecting the pastor, but you're rejecting God who gives the Holy Spirit to you. See, God says, look, you got to gotta pull your vessel together, your body. You can't allow this thing to be dwelling in your mind. Let me just, you know, reestablish a fact here. God created the sexual relationship. He created this. It's for our pleasure. You know, it's kind of weird when you say something. It's almost like sacrilegious, you know, like, God can bless your sex life. Uh, what? Uh, whoa, can you say that in church? Did you just say that? Yes. See, God never said no to sex. He says, wait for sex until you come into a covenant relationship with that person that you're going to marry. And then once you get married, not like, well, we're going to get married. Oh, are you really? Yes, yeah, so we're sleeping together now. Well, when are you getting married? Oh, maybe in the next five years. Oh, no, oh, oh. no, excuse me. No, it's when you walk into the covenant relationship. I made the covenant. I signed the marriage contract. I did a covenant between God and between all my family and friends. We're married. Now we can have the sexual relationship. See, and God made it. Why? He made it special for those people that are willing to commit for the rest of their life. They're saying, oh, you're willing to commit for the rest of your life? Here's your little bonus. Here's the icing on the cake. This is something just for you and your wife. See, so me and my wife, we could go hang out with you and your wife, right? We can go places. Man, we can go out to dinner. We can go rent a vacation home together. And you take the back of the house. We'll take the front of the house. But when it comes to the sexual relationship, nobody touches this. It's husband and wife only. Nobody goes there. You don't talk about it with anyone else. It's just between you two. And God made it special. The world has taken it and made it unspecial. Whoever, this, that, one night flings, whatever. It's like, no, it's supposed to be for the husband and wife only. And you notice how God uses that in a husband and wife relationship. Because have you ever got to the point, I'm talking to the married couples here, where you're just like, yeah, I don't like that person anymore. I don't love them. I don't even like them. Look at them. They're a hairy beast, okay? It's like, you know, and you just get to that point. You just kind of get stale in the marriage and everything, and you can go through those little funky times and everything, and then what happens? You know, you have that, you know, radical, you know, lovemaking ravage that goes on, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I love you. <laughs> You're the best thing that ever happened in life, you know? And it's like a, God uses that sexual relationship in a marriage as a healing bomb, and all of a sudden it's like, yes, I guess you remember how much I love you, and oh, yes. And so that's, did I just say all that? Well, anyway, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to get on all this stuff, but, but that is the meaning of the sexual relationship in a marriage. And if there's a couple places in Proverbs and in the book of Song of Solomon, it gets a little racy in there. And you're thinking, whoa, hoo, la, la, you know, but uh, it's all for the marriage couple. So whenever you hear me talking about the purity of the sexual relationship, it's not that God doesn't want you to have a nice and awesome relationship sexually with your partner. It's just the partner needs to be your married partner. 
Yes. And yes, people will say, but again, no, but this is the 21st century. But again, verse 8 in 1 Thessalonians 4 says, if you reject this, you're not rejecting man. You're not like, oh, that pastor over at Core Church, he's so like, you know, in the cobwebs, you know, wake up to the 21st century. No, if you're not accepting of this, you're rejecting God on this issue and in our present culture. And so our present culture has said what? God, we don't need you. God, you're out to date. You're out of date. It's like this is a sexual revolution. You, you know, God, you just, you know, you're off on this area, okay? You're off in this area. Okay, well, let's look at the results. So we said, God, you know what you're talking about. In the mid-60s, we went for the full, you know, uh, sexual revolution, Rolling Stones, the Doors, man. It was a whole new thing, man. You know, peace, drugs, and rock and roll, okay? And sex and everything else. So all of a sudden, now where are we at today because of that? We abort millions of babies a year. These are unwanted babies, and we abort them. Of course, we got the whole law passed on abortion because of possible incest or rape, which is less than one half of 1% of all abortions. So the other 99.5% of abortions is because someone got pregnant doing what God said not to do, not including the over 1.5 million babies born to unwed mothers. That's 36% of all babies born in America. And that's not counting the millions that are infected with some sort of sexually transmitted disease. So God says, don't do this. Man says, no, we're doing it. Okay, well, that's the result. That's what happened. So we don't listen to God, and that's what happens. But again, Jesus takes this to a whole new level by saying, if you just look at the woman and you lust after her, you're guilty of committing adultery. But why? Why just looking? Because that's where it all starts. That's his whole point. Know this. The window of our hearts is through our eyes. That's where it happens. Listen to this quote. Let a man or a woman begin to guard their eyes on what they choose to look at, and that will be the beginning of truly keeping their hearts pure before the Lord. Unquote. And if we choose to disregard this, and continue to look at others lustfully, then it's only a matter of time before we could fall prey and act out on our fantasies. That's why looking at pornography is so dangerous, because it takes lustful thinking to a whole new level, as it always proves to be a ticking time bomb inside of the person. For the inward and the outward are interconnected. People will come in for counseling. Man, I'm just really dealing with lust, lust. Man, I'm just thinking about lust all the time. Lust, lust. It's like, well, what are you doing? It's like, well, you know, I watch pornography all day. Well, well, maybe that's a key. That could be a key. See, it's all interconnected. And if we allow the passionate desires of our flesh to go unchecked, where all you're thinking about is this one thing, we will sin. We will sin. That's why Jesus said in verse 29, if your right eye makes you stumble and fall, rip it out. Well, before any of us start tearing our eyeballs out, okay, pastor, if you insist, (laughs) okay, listen, hold up, okay, just, you know, slow down a little bit, you know, so before, you know, we do that, you know, and before we cut off our hands, like he said, you know, like he said in verse 30, we need to slow down and first establish what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, I repeat, he's not saying, just go rip out your eyeball. Well, wait a minute, he just said that, we read it. Well, hold on, he didn't, he doesn't mean it, he's using it as an analogy, because lust is centered into the heart. And if we did rip out our right eye, okay, we all rip out our right eye, okay, I've lusted after one, okay, I've ripped out my right, we still got our left eye, okay, it's still there. Okay, then we can say, well, let me rip out my left eye. And then we rip that out. But we're still stuck with the memories of what caused us to rip our eyeballs out, okay? Because they're still in there. Uh, Me and my wife, uh, we had a friend at this first church that we were going to when we first got married. And he came to, he was blind, and he played the organ there. And uh, a really cool guy, really neat brother and everything. And I was talking with him one day, and he goes, man, pray for me, man. I'm like, "Uh, okay, for what? He goes, man, I'm really struggling with lust for women. And I'm like... Really? And not like, you know, I'm, I'm 19 years old, so, okay, you know, and, and maybe I should have been a little more, you know, politically correct or whatever. I'm like going, dude, you can't see. What are you lusting for? You know? And, and, and he's, like, he's like, oh, no. 
He goes, I, I hear the way they walk. <laughs> well, how do you know it's a, it, it's a man or a woman? He goes, oh, oh I know. And, and, I, and I'm just like, you know, see, so lust, it, I mean, it's like even if we ripped our eyeballs out, we'd still be lusting. I mean, it's just that's what our heart is. That's why God says our heart is bad. Jesus is just making a very clear point about ripping the eye out, cutting the hand off of just how serious the sin of lust and evil desire really are. So what he's saying here is in comparison to ripping out our eye, in comparison to cutting off our hand, this is how drastic of a reaction we should have with dealing with our own sin. Well, I mean, it should be like, oh my goodness, I have to deal with this, meaning whatever it takes, I got to cut the thing out. I got to change my routine. Whatever you can do, get rid of whatever causes you to stumble. That's why he's saying, okay, take your face. Well, that surely sounds weird. But anyway, take your, move it another way. Whatever it takes, get away from what you're looking at. You know, when you're, you, when you're laying in bed, you know, because you have like the, the routine, right? You get, your alarm goes off, you get up, got to take a shower, da, 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 you know, it's like routine. Okay, get up, go home. But then you get in trouble like on a Saturday night. You're sleeping in. So you're sleeping in. You don't have to be anymore. The alarm's not going off. And all of a sudden, ooh, you know, a little fantasy island. You start thinking about so-and-so and this person. And all of a sudden, oh, yeah, you know, it's like when those thoughts come into my head now, you know, I've just, you know, the thing that I do, I start quoting scripture. And I just, these verses that I've memorized in my heart that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in, in accordance with the lust of deceit, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to, verse to 24. And I just start thinking about God's word. And then, you know, and then after you're doing that a while, if I don't go back to sleep, then I was like, okay, time to get up. Let's go. <laughs> it's like, not going to lay here in bed because that's not going to be a good thing. So there's just things that you have to learn to do so you don't dwell on these things. Because again, Jesus is trying to get us to understand that when we think about something long enough, we could very well do it. Does that make sense? Yes. That's the end result of sin that's unchecked in our heart will always bring forth death. So don't ever give up. You might say, well, yeah, but, you know, I had all these issues in my life as a Christian, and I, I cleaned all these things up, but, man, there's these couple, man, it's really hard, and maybe lust is one of them, and you're like, man, I don't know if I can get over this thing. Listen, don't ever give up. Don't ever throw up the white flag. I don't care how many times you fail, you keep moving on. We must continue the battle until the day Jesus takes us home. Yes, the law tells us how bad these things really are, and don't forget Ultimately, it's just sin against God. He's not pleased. In our third and final point now, the answer to the problem. How can we purify the desires of our own heart and our own mind? Well, first, we must guard what we allow ourselves to look at. Again, consider Job. He walked with God. He lived an upright life before God. His book is found. It's the book right before the book of Psalms, the book of Job. Now, it was Job that said this about his eyes. He said this in Job 31.1. He says, I have made a covenant with my eyes to not look with lust upon a woman. That word covenant that he used there, he made an agreement with himself. I will not do this, he said. I like what it says in 1 Corinthians 9.25. You know, Paul must have been quite the sports fan because, you know, they had the Greek sports and, you know, the Olympics all started back there in Greece. And, you know, so he must have been a sports fan because he's always kind of using sports analogies. So he says in 1 Corinthians 9.25, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Meaning, if you're an athlete, you watch what you eat, you exercise, you have to be disciplined. He says they do it for, to receive a perishable wreath. He's saying they're doing it for the trophy, but the trophy's going to burn one day. You can't take your trophies to heaven. Were you the track star in high school? That's nice. Can't take the trophy to heaven. Sorry. Okay. Did you win the baking cook-off? That's great, but you can't take the blue ribbon. It's just like, it's just what it is. But he goes on to say, but we as Christians, we're going for the imperishable trophy in heaven of being the son or the daughter of God that lived their life godly. He says, therefore, I run... Paul says, in such a way as not without aim. 
I box in such a way as not just beating the air. He says, I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And that word that he uses there, I discipline myself. It really means like I beat myself black and blue. I'm not going to allow myself to do wrong. So he's saying, it's, it's like I, I'm going to take my foot. Boom. Okay, d- don't do that. Stop. Boom. Slap yourself in the face. <laughs> Look the other way. Get out of here. And that's what you have to do sometimes. Because you get caught up in a place and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And you, there's no way of like, okay, let me just be godly, be godly. Be, no, get out of there. Leave. Don't stay in that place. Just leave the premises. Know this, lust is an imagination of a sinful act. Job said, I will not allow myself or my mind to wander into lust, into those areas that I know that are wrong. So number one, I have to look away. If someone entices, if something entices me, I just got to look the way, I got to go away. It's like me and my wife, you know, we're not going to go to Las Vegas. You know, we, we went there, I think, man, it was back in like 1995 or something like that. We went there. Hey, great, you know, priced on a hotel room. And, you know, you get food for cheap and all that. But you know what? There's so much pornography all over the ground. It's like in all over the little big screens and all that. It's like, I, we, we can't go there. Yeah, but you can get great deals. It doesn't matter. Forget the deal. We, we can't go there. We're not going there. Because it's like there's things that are enticing there. Number two, I will not allow myself to dwell on thoughts of fantasy. Remember, if we sow a thought, we'll reap an act. If we sow an act, we'll reap a habit. If we sow a habit, we will reap a character. If we sow a character, we could reap our own destiny. So the answer to the problem of looking at another lustfully really comes down to just three points. Number one. Guard our eyes. Guard what we look at. And that will be the beginning of truly keeping our hearts pure before the Lord. Again, the window of our hearts is through the eyes. Number two, we must, we must avoid at all costs putting ourselves in places of temptation. As Christians, we lose the right to go to certain places. I've heard that, you know, I've heard, uh, you know, it said before, and I know you have too, that good girls go to heaven. But bad girls go everywhere. Yes, that's true. Bad girls do go everywhere. And they might go wherever they want here in this life. But one day, they will not have a say-so on where they spend eternity. Because if they go everywhere here in this life, they will only go one place in the next life. And that is to a place called hell. And separated from God. This is why we have to speak the truth of God's word to this dark world that we live in. Because there's bad girls that need to know that there's a good God that loves them and they can be forgiven. Bad boys need to know that there's a God that loves them that will forgive them. Yes, we have to have a heart that reaches out to those that are living in sin so they can repent. Because today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. And we all know those people that need to come to know Christ. Yes, everywhere we go is another opportunity to tangibly live out our faith to those around us. Remember what he said back in verse 16? Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Yes. And third, we must replace the don'ts in our lives... With the do's. Replace the don'ts with do's. Meaning, it's not just enough not to look at bad stuff. Why don't we look at the good stuff? Why don't we read the Bible? Why don't we understand what God says in his word? The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You want to grow and mature in your faith? Read God's word. It's not enough to just stop hanging out with the wrong crowd. Let's start hanging out with the right crowd. Why don't you stop hanging out with people that are just party animals and what have you, or people that are always telling dirty jokes, or people that are always doing the wrong thing. Why don't you start hanging out with other brothers and sisters in Christ that are doing the right thing? It's not just enough to stop doing the wrong things. Let's start doing the right things. All from a heart that wants to please God. So when we come to church, let's honor God by working on those relationships that have soured. We need to work with those people that have, we've broken relationships with. You know, the Bible says in Romans 12, 17, he says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. 
Respect what is right in the sight of men. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. God says, man, work on this. Don't be angry with people. Never take your own revenge, he says, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on their head. What? Burning coals on their head? Yes. Because one of two things will happen when you love people that are not lovable. They'll look at you and they'll say, you're a nut. They'll always say that. But then they'll say, but man, this guy just keeps loving on me. It's like the guy at the gym, you know, the, the Jew. And he's just, you know, we debate back and forth. But you know what? He keeps talking to me because he knows ultimately I care about his soul. So even though we have all these disagreements, he keeps, you know, we keep talking because I care about him. I want him to come to know Christ as his Savior, as the Messiah. You know, and it's just like, and, and you know, and because he knows that I, I do care about him, that's why we keep talking about this thing. So, you know, one of two things will happen again. One, they'll come to know Christ as their Savior. Or they'll hate you even more, and then God says, look, if they turn down all the opportunities to come to Christ, then one day they'll fall into the judgment hand of me, and I will deal with them harshly. Yes, in the Sermon on the Mount, the heart of the matter is always the matter of the heart. Remember how we read that verse? We'll close with this. We read that verse last week in Deuteronomy 5, 29. God said, oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments. Always that it may be well with them and their sons forever. That's God's will for you. That you would follow him. That you would do what's right. You know, that you would, that it would be well with you. God says, I want it to be well with you. Are his commandments really that burdensome? Hey, don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. Or her husband. Or his husband. Or whoever his husband. Whatever. You get what I'm saying. But it's like, don't be a thief. Don't steal your neighbor's lawnmower. I mean, is it, I mean, are these really, oh, man, the Bible's just a bunch of rules and regulations. Really? Really? Is, I mean, is that how you look at it? God wants you to be well. He wants it to be well with you. I want you to live upright. I want you to have joy in your heart. I want you to wake up with a smile on your face. That's God's will for you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just come before.